Welcome to the arena. Quake Arena Arcade was released in 2010, and as the name would suggest, is a console port of Quake 3 Arena for the Xbox 360. It was released in a time where Call of Duty Brain Rot was really starting to fester in the 7th generation. Quake offered purely skill-based arena combat, free from any frills or crutches that would dominate the gaming landscape for decades to come, but that very same dated game design is what made Quake Arcade less appealing to a modern audience, and with literally no marketing whatsoever, we got a game that was dead on arrival. As far as I can tell, this is the first full video review of this game, save for uh... Yeah, see, ver it, it, the, the disappointing thing about this game is that uh, uh, not all the weapons are on all of the maps. I wish they did that. Huh. Man, I wonder what this guy is up to nowadays. Anyways, this is why Quake Arena Arcade is the best console shooter you have never played. But you really should. Seriously, it's only $5 on Xbox. Please play with me. Starting off, I'll get this out of the way. The UI is not flattering at all, but Quake 3's was arguably worse, so it's really not that big of a deal. It's just bland, and uh, you're going to see it a lot. Like every other shooter released at the time, Quake Arcade has two ways of playing. Offline with AI bots, or online with real human beings. Seeing as the game was dead 13 years ago, it's pretty safe to assume that nobody plays this game online anymore, so I'll be sticking to the offline single player aspect. In the single player, you've got two modes. Firstly, you've got practice mode. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Just gotta choose a map, the mode, etc. I really enjoy setting up bots to their hardest difficulty and fighting in a free-for-all brawl to see who gets the most kills in 10 minutes. I'll be honest, this practice mode alone is worth the price of admission for me. The novelty of being able to play Quake 3 without having my entire existence erased by a clan of boomers who've been playing this game since 1999 is a treat. And it's something I did not have as a kid when I was dipping my toes into the arena FPS genre in the early 2000s. So, all things considered, these AI bots are a pretty good substitute for real players. Thanks to John Carmack's advances in artificial intelligence, these bots can really rock your shit. One of them air-shotted me with such perfect precision tracking, I swear I could hear in the background. And you know what? I'm fine with that. It feels chaotic, and I'm not just a juggernaut that steamrolls every match. Besides, even on a controller, I can hit air shots too. Moving on from practice mode, the game also offers a campaign. In it, you play as a new combatant to the Arena Eternal, which is basically a multi-dimensional fight club set up by the gods to keep themselves amused from their godly tasks like, I don't know, giving me fibromyalgia? Your goal is to best the champion of the arena. Zero. He really reminds me of the Delay Llama plugin. <laughs> Zero is basically the WWE heavyweight champion of the multiverse, and you want his belt. In order to accomplish this, you need to fight your way through all of the best warriors the arena has to offer. These arena fights consist mostly of first 20 free-for-all death matches against increasingly difficult combatants. The map variation and side missions add enough variety to keep things fresh all the way through the campaign. And the combat is where this game truly shines. This is pure arena FPS bliss. Even from a casual perspective, this game holds up 13 years later. The guns all feel responsive, and enemies feel tough, but fair. I was even able to hit bunny hops consistently, which is unheard of on console. Except for maybe on Titanfall, but, you know, that's dead too. Now, you're probably asking yourself, Hey Rig, how are you bunny hopping so well? Well, dear viewer, I'll answer by telling you that you can do this too. I personally use an Xbox Elite Series 2 controller, which allows me to bind my A button to one of the back paddles. I keep it on my movement hand and it lets me B hop with relative ease. If price is an issue, you can get a Power A wired controller for around 15 bucks that'll let you do the same thing. Just make sure it's got the advanced buttons on the back. Moving on to the weapons. In total, this game has 12 force multipliers and each one has a specific use. 
They are as follows. The machine gun. This is your basic starter gun. It's weak, but it gives consistent damage if you can track your shots. The shotgun. The id software staple two barrel lead slinger. This time with a laser sight for, I don't know, accuracy? Get up close and personal and show the bad guys how cool this thing sounds. The grenade launcher. A good old pineapple dispenser. Capable of carpeting an area with devastating explosives. The rocket launcher. Quake's bread and butter problem solver. Its high damage and easy learning curve make it the easiest gun to pick up for new players. But when you get good with it, it shows. The lightning gun. Your life is nothing. You serve zero purpose. You should kill yourself now. The rail gun. This RGB gamer gun hurls devastating uranium slugs with pinpoint accuracy and no deviation. If you miss with this thing, it's your own damn fault. It's also the only gun with customization in the game, letting you select the color of your rails, or you can use green like a normal person. The Plasma Gun Aesthetically speaking, this is my favorite in the entire game, sporting a high-tech look and juicy sound effects. The Nail Gun The shotgun's beefier older brother that fell in with a bad crowd. This gun sounds amazing when you hit all your nails on target. Lead your shots, and this flechette cannon will never fail you. The proxy launcher. This little doohickey is reserved exclusively for CTF modes. It shoots proxy mines on the ground that detonate when enemies get close. Perfect for defending your flag. The chain gun. I have no way to kill cowards. Charge me! Yavol! I am for the <laughs> the BFG 10,000. This version of the BFG is way different than any other iteration of it. Instead of the trademark tracer effect in all of the other Doom games, this BFG is a rapid fire explosive plasma cannon that demolishes enemies within two shots. Last but not least, the Gauntlet, the mainstay melee weapon of the Arena Eternal. The Gauntlet is a wrist-mounted buzzsaw that shreds enemies to ribbon. Getting a frag with this bumper car simulator gives you the coveted humiliation. When I was a kid, I tried to get a humiliation to end every match I played. Even nowadays, I still feel kind of compelled to do it. Scattered around the map are a variety of pickups, usually consisting of health, armor, ammo, and one-time use items. Legalized nuclear bombs. Among these pickups are more useful power-ups, haste, armor regeneration. The big one, though, is Well, let me tell all you young people out there, the big man would run 20 miles for a I mean, tell you. I will get a couple of them fucking... Now, that was the best fucking drug ever made! Quick Arcade's maps span over a wide range of locales across the multiverse. From earthly military bases to the war-torn factories of Stragos, primordial castles in the clouds, outer space, hell, and everywhere in between. Some of these maps are awesome, but some of their names are just ridiculous. Featuring such bangers like Place of Many Deaths, Arena of Death, Forgotten Place, The Longest Yard, Jump works, but it's spelled works. Me on a Friday night. Me on a Friday night. Dueling Keeps 2, which is funny because there isn't a Dueling Keeps 1. While these map names are funny, these are classic Quake mainstays. But the port also brings with it a few maps from the original Team Arena expansion, and some maps that were made specifically for this port. The OG maps play as tightly designed as they were 23 years ago, and the newcomers look amazing, showing off all of the polish afforded by creating a map a decade after the game came out. Let's talk about the music. This game has a stellar soundtrack, featuring some tracks from Quake 3 and some unreleased songs made specifically for this port. Altogether, this soundtrack is exactly what I'm looking for in an arena shooter. Industrial metal really suits this type of game's aesthetic. Cards on the table though, this soundtrack is really repetitive. As good as it is, it just it's so samey. 
because the devs needed to cut a few corners to keep the file size within Xbox Live's limitations, most of Quake 3's OST was cut from the port, so some of these songs play every match for multiple matches on end. Good luck getting this riff out of your head. A quarter of the way into getting footage for this video, I turned the music off entirely. This is a game I'd categorize as a bring your own beats kind of deal. For this video, I've been using a super underrated band called RTPM. They've been making old school industrial metal for close to two decades, and I swear have not released a bad song. Options wise, you have your standard fare of settings, brightness, volume, X and Y sensitivity, etc. The one thing that genuinely surprised me though, id Software was able to port Quake 3's full roster of characters to choose from. If you're fighting someone you think looks cool, you can play as them. You're even able to swap skins mid-match. Some of these skins are really awesome and bring fighters from all over the multiverse. Warriors like Ranger from Quake 1, Doom Guy from Doom, Zero, Tony Hawk from Tony Hawk's Project 8, Jet from Lethal League, Jet from Jet Set Radio, the guy from the badass Quake 3 intro cutscene that isn't in this port of the game. Why didn't you put it in, John? Doom Guy from Doom. Doom Guy from Doom, but with the N word pass. Doom Guy from Doom, but a girl. A literal fucking nuts. A funny little anecdote here. Phobos. This dude I mentioned earlier, while effectively just serving as a reskin of Doom, he is a character with lore and has been referenced quite a lot in recent years. He's been in both modern Doom games. First as a Funko Pop in Doom 2016, and then as an unlockable skin in Doom Eternal. Fortnite has a Phobos skin in it. There's even been officially licensed Phobos figures. Plural. All of this recognition for a character that the Doom fanbase has largely forgotten. I feel like I'm the only person nowadays who remembers who this dude is. But enough about that. Let's get back on track. Other options included Force Model, which makes every other character's model the same as yours and Force Sport, which shows the eSports variant of each player's chosen skin, making them a bright monster energy green, invisible in any lighting condition. This means that you can force the game to put all players on equal footing no matter where they are on the map. I wish more games would really try this thing out, but then again, Halo tried to do that with their art style and everyone threw a fit about it, but that has more to say about Halo fans bitching about everything than the effectiveness of forced visibility. So let me know in the comments how you feel about these options. I'd love to discuss this with someone. Although this game has a multitude of great options, I have a few gripes with the settings, namely the double digits FOV and the aim sensitivity. We'll start with the latter first. Aiming is just janky in this game. Even with my sensitivity turned all the way down, my aim felt jerky and I just couldn't keep a bead on anyone to save my life. I eventually stopped aiming as much and just strafed into my shots because the aim sensitivity was just too inconsistent to even try to rely on. Trying to track with full autos felt more like I was trying to hose out a house fire with a garden hose. There's no aim smoothing and even with the Elite Series 2's stick smoothing options, I wasn't able to get a setting that worked with me. The other big issue is the game's abysmally low FOV. I get that most shooters across the 7th generation of consoles had this issue, but 60 degrees of FOV in a game where 100 degrees is considered low is just unforgivable. They needed to put an FOV slider in this game. John Carmack, what were you thinking here, bud? While these seemingly game-breaking issues may look bad from an outsider's perspective, the core gameplay loop is too fun to be held back by its faults. This is some of the best casual gaming I've had in years. This game is a testament to my belief that arena FPS games are still viable in today's audience. Arguably more so in recent years given the rise of try-hard Twitch streamers, but those kinds of people can stick to Quake Live on PC. I'm good on Xbox. Major update, while in the middle of editing this video, my dad, the Giga Chad that got me hooked into id Software games, he just found out that this is on Xbox One, will be able to capture some footage of online play, something this game saw very little of. So. Thanks, Dad. All in all, Quake Arcade is a mostly perfect port to the Xbox 360. Its gameplay loop and ease of accessibility make it a casual gamer's dream, but it's held back by its low player count and lack of public knowledge. If you've got $5, seriously consider putting it towards getting this game. Together, we can bring this game back from its premature grave. I'm trying to organize play sessions on my TikTok for people who want to join in on the fun. Join my Discord down below if you want in. 
Thank you for watching. If you like what you saw, please leave a like. If you didn't, tell me why. Yada yada, smash that subscribe button, etc, etc. My name is Rigor Mortis, and I hope you have a good one.